I'm on. Hey. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Megan. Matt. Good afternoon. Good right. afternoon. Good morning. Hold on. Yeah, see, I'm noon. I'm, I'm in New York. You can tell by the very small hotel room I'm, I'm sitting in right now. <laughs> it's a nice backdrop. Um, we'll just give everyone a couple seconds to hop on. Um, super excited to have you three on. I think it's going to be a great conversation. You all have so much experience, and I just want to thank you all for your willingness to participate and kick off the holidays with some great conversation. Yeah, absolutely, Meg. Well, look, when, when, when Matt uh, asked to join something, it's a pretty easy decision. So, then Matt, thanks for the invitation. Hi. Megan, thanks for hosting. And Ryan, thanks. great to be on with you. Yeah, thank you. Be fun. Are you guys able to see my screen? Yeah. Yep. Awesome. All right. Well, as people trickle in, um, I'd love to just say if you could put in the chat uh, where you're joining in from. I am in Philadelphia, PA. It's shockingly warm here. So um, excited to hopefully get a white Christmas, but it's seeming unlikely. Um, but if you guys could just go through and say where you're joining from as well, Matt, Kevin, and uh, Ryan. Sure. Uh, Matt Gar, uh, and I'm joining from New York City. Love it. All right. Kevin Canarium, I'm joining from uh, Park City, Utah. Yeah, Ryan Burke, I'm joining from Boston. Love it. Awesome. I'm seeing a lot of locations trickle in, Austin, Texas, Boston as well. Um, so we have a widespread. Um, and those that are joined, thank you so much for registering. Um, as a follow-up, we will be recording this session. So anyone from your team that wasn't able to attend, we'll be sure to send that out to you um, to share it as a resource within your team. Um, as we dive into today, uh, you have registered for the top secrets to navigating revenue growth and sales comp as a CRO. You have three of the best here with you. Matt Gar from Spiff, Kevin Kinnearum, and Ryan Burke. Um, I'm just going to pass it to each of them to give a little self-intro um, to share some of their uh, weathered knowledge with you today. Weathered, uh, weathered indeed. Yeah. Yes, uh, Matt, uh, Matt Gar, CRO at Spiff, have been in the tech space in uh, sales leadership for over 20 years. Uh, generally join in the 10 to 15 million range and have uh, been involved in one scale to 450 plus, another to 200 million. Um, joined Spiff about a year and a half ago. Love being in the sales tech uh, space. So excited to be here. I'll kick it to my colleague, Kevin, next. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Hey, everyone. Kevin Canarium. Uh, I've spent the last five years, 20 quarters, as the uh, head of go-to-market and CRO at Clary, and most recently have transitioned into a new role as a president of Strategic Go-to-Market. Um, this is my second time as a CRO. Last company was earlier stage, and we did a quick exit into Oracle um, and spent most of my career in really big uh, companies prior to that. Um, looking forward to uh, some of the Q&A we'll get later today. Great. Now, Ryan Burke, um, currently consulting, but I've been running go-to-market teams for the last 20 years, predominantly as a CRO. Um, did a pretty good stint at a company called Envision in the design space, where we sort of evolved the PLG motion. Joined early days, scaled up to about 120 million revenue in uh, in five years, and uh, the last few months I've been doing some investing and uh, advising and some consulting. So appreciate having me. Awesome, so great to have all of you. And for the audience, I just want to encourage you in the Q and A section on your right. Please feel free to sprinkle in some questions as we go through. I know these guys are eager with uh, some awesome answers. And with that, I will pass it to you, Matt. All right, I'm going to click the slide. Did you click the slide for me? You did. Yeah. Okay, all right, I'll click the next one, make sure I get it right. Um, I, this list could probably be 104 long. It's It's been an interesting market the last few years. I think if there's anything I've learned is that there's constant change and it's moving at a quicker pace. So um, I get the pleasure of speaking with CROs and senior sales leaders uh, as part of my role, which has just uh, been, been a, a joy over the last couple of years. So you have a lot of things that I think we all understand. Anyone who had tech squarely in their ICP in 21 and 22 has felt shifts in demand uh, that has had an impact on our on our funnel conversion. Um, that's obviously a challenge that we many of us uh, have faced as well. One thing that is really prevalent to what I do for a living is okay, you're you're you know the market has changed, so you're changing your revenue mix targets. Have you adjusted your how you're incentivizing those? So. Um, you really have to consider if you're going to point your cannons at different things, 
well, how, you know, how am I going to make sure that my team is aligned with that as well? Um, the, you know, pre uh, the kind of pullback in, in 22, 23, significant amount of early stage businesses trying to get to that first million, fifth million, 10th million, not always easy to do, especially as the market slows down a little bit. Um, and, you know, I, I do hear a lot of conversations and comments around back to the basics, you know, to some extent that when you get into this lower demand era, you got to get back to kind of grinding some of the, the basics back out and, and just simplifying your go to market approach um, in the market today to ensure that uh, that you're you know getting through there what you can. It can get pretty complex out there as it pertains to different tools. We leverage indicators at every stage of the of the way. And, um, you know, the more you can, I think, simplify the concepts that you're getting to and and communicate those to the team, um, the more you can kind of overcome uh, overcome that challenge. So I want to ask everyone in the audience to please uh, post in the chat what you see as your biggest revenue challenge that you're facing today. We may or may not get to it right away, but it'll be something that potentially we hit as we get downstream uh, into the conversation. So the, the first item we're going to talk about, I'm going to have Kevin lead this as kind of, you know, top of funnel conversion. We're starting at the top of the funnel. It's a, that's a great place to start. Um, so Kevin, let me kick it over to you and you can talk a little bit about what, you, uh, uh, what you're seeing from a top of funnel perspective. Absolutely. Thanks, Matt. Um, so probably and quite arguably the, one of the hottest topics for anybody leading a, you know, SaaS revenue business in today's uh, macro environment. And so I kind of actually want to think about it as top of funnel and conversion, right? Because you, you've got two challenges here, right? Is producing enough top of funnel and then actually being able to convert that um, through your early stages and all the way to close. So if we think about top of funnel, you know, one of the things that we've done at Clary, you know, especially as the macro started to turn is we, we started to really look at our data and we pulled together what we call leading indicators. Um, and this was a call that happened every Monday with myself, our CEO, our head of marketing, our head of rev ops, um, and our head of finance. And we started to really look at what was the data telling us so that we could orient the business out on a rolling four quarters. <clears throat> and what we started to see, right, is that the waterfalls that we had built that produced the coverage model that we needed to hit our targets um, were changing, right? And obviously this trickles all the way down to the comp plans that you put in front of your reps. But what we started to see was we needed more coverage, right? Because of other things that were happening in regards to conversion as things were moving through the funnel. So I think best practices, you've got to get a handle on all of the factors that you have to produce top of funnel. And this is where data becomes super important, right? Is looking at it by segment, by industry, customer versus new logo, um, you know, competitive data, and then putting all of this and harvesting it uh, so that you can have a, a really constructive conversation around top of funnel and where you need to place your bets. What parts of the business need more spend, more marketing, more ABM? Did we lose Kevin? It's seeming so. Maybe he'll hop back on. Oh, there we go. Good old internet. And then really the, the second part of this, right? Kevin, you with us? We lost you for a okay. second. Am I back, Matt? Yeah, you're back now. Um, All right, guys. That's thank okay. you, uh, Xfinity. Looks like we're going to have technical difficulties for a bit here. Oh, Kevin, I think you may be on mute. No, I think it's technical. Difficulty. Okay. Matt, we might have to pivot to you. Yeah, it sounds that way. We'll let him jump uh, jump back in. So I guess the group question here, it looks like he's going to drop out, is what strategies or tactics have you found most effective in optimizing top of funnel conversion? And Kevin was kind of getting to the root, I think, of the issue. is really digging deep into each of the different motions <clears throat> segment team type of revenue. I can say from our seat, we had just uh, fielded our, our first kind of what I'll call customer AE, customer sales motion with a, a pretty heavily balanced portfolio towards tech. So we found it pretty difficult to get meaningful pipeline growth going on the cross sell motion uh, because we had a significant amount of tech players who were pulling back on their own spend on commissions. So selling them that second and third product became pretty difficult. So, I, you know, just openly sharing one area where we were unable to get that 
conversion um, that we needed. We did also see, uh, you know, the need to shift our focus from an industry perspective. We grew, you know, very significantly during the explosive 21, 22 period uh, in tech. Um, but the cool part about what Spiff does is it's very much a horizontal play. Anyone who's driving revenue is probably paying someone some type of commission to drive that revenue that allows allowed us to flex. And we went pretty aggressively into retail, manufacturing, uh, finance, and uh, insurance to diversify out our pipeline. The challenge with some of those more traditional industries is the conversion rates at the time may have been slightly higher, but the time to buy because they're more traditional industries slowed down. So then we were offsetting, okay, we got a nice little peak in top of funnel in, in different industries, but that industry mix meant a different velocity. So we were having to kind of grapple with that uh, as well in the period. Um, I, it, from For our business, the top of funnel kind of shift, it, it, the, con the lower conversion rates bottomed out, luckily in Q2 of this year, we've seen things start to pick back up. And there's some certain areas in the funnel as you get later on, which I'll talk to later, we made some adjustments on the enablement side to really start to get things uh, get things rolling for us. So one quick shout out though. I mean, we all know that it's a social world and a social selling world, but I can't stress enough that we have our buyers, all of us out there doing research and looking at things at all moments. So I got to acknowledge our marketing team and specifically Molly, who runs our um, digital and social programs. She's kept us in the game so consistently with buyers that have high intent with really cool content out there. So for those of you that haven't built out a robust approach to social, you're a little behind, but it's not too late to catch up because it will be a difference maker for you. Kevin, I see you're back, but I just jumped in to share yeah. some of the things I've learned over the, yeah. over the last couple of months. Matt, thanks for picking. Thanks for picking it up, man. I, I yeah. appreciate it. And um, sorry, folks, for for my internet. Um, it sounds like we got to the the question, and maybe Ryan, over to you. What are sure. some of the strategies that you're talking to companies that you you work with? Um, yeah, that, you know, found a really turned on maybe re-optimize the top of funnel and the conversion process. Yeah, no, definitely. I think there's a couple things that, you know, Matt mentioned the uh, the social aspect. I would also mention the content aspect because, you know, content's obviously like this, a great way to get people engaged, but you also want to give your sales team other vehicles to create touch points with their target customers, right? And so, you know, enabling people on, enabling your sales team on content can sometimes be as effective is enabling them on the product because you're giving them a non-invasive way to reach out to somebody and ultimately add value. So I would definitely, you know, stress the importance of a content driven approach, especially in today's world where, you know, there's so many restrictions on outbound. Everybody's getting hit from so many different channels. You have to have something interesting to say. And then, you know, on the marketing side, um, you know, as Matt mentioned as well on the um, MQLs, tough. You know, and so you just got to make sure you're measuring the right thing. And, you know, Matt mentioned the quality that Molly's delivering to the team. I mean, that's exactly it, right? You don't want to get in a situation where the marketing team is sort of beating their chest around, you know, how much interest they're getting through MQLs if it's not translating into real conversions. And so you just want to make sure that you're moving the goalposts to something that's got a level of quality included in addition to the, to the, uh, to the quantity and maybe it's at the top of the funnel. Yeah, super helpful, Ryan. And I think as you think about content and also, you know, enablement becomes critical. And I know a lot of companies as customers I've spoken to have pivoted their go to markets a bit. Um, at Clary, we've gone from really solution to platform. And, you know, that changes how you think about enablement and the messaging that goes forward across those early stage opportunities. Yep. So let's, um, let's pivot to the next topic. Um, I'm going to move us forward here. If anyone's followed Clary, you've heard us talk about this notion of revenue leak. And what is revenue leak? It's essentially revenue that you've earned, but you haven't closed. So I'll explain what that means. And what we really try to look at is how do we move from revenue leak to revenue precision? And so what's an example of revenue leak? Let's say, for instance, you've actually produced that top of funnel lead. And that top of funnel lead gets handed off <clears throat> to a SDR whose job is to then move it you know, forward and hopefully get it qualified by a sales rep. Well, what happens if that lead doesn't move forward, right? If it gets moved to the sales rep, the sales rep doesn't pick it up or doesn't follow up in a timely manner or isn't prepared to have a real conversation to move it to the next stage in the process. Those are moments of revenue leak. Like you've spent the money top of funnel, you haven't moved it forward. Or you're down in you know, your, your sales stage three and you're trying to close a deal 
but all of a sudden the deal slips and it moves into an out quarter and you don't know why, right? That slippage is leakage, right? It's revenue that you've worked really hard to get to a mature state and all of a sudden it's slipped out of your quarter. And so you think about all these moments along the continuous customer journey where things fall out or things shrink because of competitors or, or pricing, that's all leakage. And at the end of the day, we, um, you know, we've worked with a lot of third parties and what we see, you know, is about 45% of executives see revenue leakage as a symptomatic problem for their company. So think about the impact that has on the operating plan of the company, on the valuation of the company and the overall return to uh, shareholders uh, for that company. So it's a huge problem and it's a huge problem hiding in plain sight. And so, you know, I talked about a couple of areas, right? A lot of this has to do with not having a way to have full command over your revenue processes, not getting data back to actually know what's happening and to take action on it. But leak shows up in many ways, slip deals, different siloed systems that don't talk to one another. Um, you might be discounting and not even know why you're discounting and leaving money on the table. Obviously churn is a major leak problem. We worked so hard to get this customer, we've invested to get them live and then all of a sudden they leave us. Um, and then missing upsell and cross sell opportunities, not understanding the white space and, and all the things that go into, you know, missing an upsell and cross sell op. And so what we'll start to talk about here in this session with, with Matt and Ryan is what are some of the strategies to combat leakage? Um, I think the biggest thing that, that we use here at Clary is obviously we run our own platform and because we have our processes mapped out and run through the Clary platform, we're capturing the data that's happening around us. We're surfacing that to the human who's responsible or humans, right? The revenue critical team who's responsible for moving that forward, leveraging AI to help spot risk and opportunity and ensure that things move through the process the way we've defined them. Um, and that's a lot of instrumentation and a lot of rigor. Um, but what we find is we can really quantify at each stage of the continuous customer journey, how we're shoring it up and how we're moving it forward and, and ultimately how we're capturing it and closing it. And a big part of this, are these handoffs, right? In a SaaS business, you, you go from marketing to SDR, to account executive, to uh, customer success, to a services team, to maybe an account manager. Um, and so there's all these handoffs that happen. And when everyone doesn't collaborate around the customer in a single pane of glass, things get lost and things ultimately leak. And so maybe, you know, as we transition here, Matt, um, you know, at, at SPIF, how are accounts handed off post sales at your org to ensure, you know, there's no, there's no missed beat in how you engage with that customer. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't argue I'm optimized here yet, but I think we know where our challenges lie is what I guess I'd say. So when I think of future customer to customer transition, um, we've got a fairly, what I'll call traditional process. There's an, you know, implementation start uh, at the point of, you know, kickoff period uh, implementation begin. We have multiple players in implementation that get involved from a data integration perspective. And then obviously managing the project itself. CS is involved and in, in, uh, introduced early and remains engaged through that implementation period. Uh, and then we have a current expansion uh, alignment of 11 months post sale that that still goes to the core AE because oftentimes you'll see a phased approach to implementing something like SPIF. And uh, we want to make sure that if you bring that new customer in, you get to optimize that. And then we have a cross sell uh, customer AE that uh, gets involved kind of late 11 months and then takes takes the cr you know cross sell or significant or I guess uh, structural expansion from there. And the way to look at SPIF is oftentimes people will start with their AEs, but you've got man, anyone who makes a variable compensation dollar can be run through SPIF and can give you one view of all variable comp across the org, but oftentimes orgs start with one subset and then maybe they'll add CS later, which is part of why we have a little bit of phasing there. Uh, one thing we've, that we have done to get way better at this and optimize is capturing on the front end, all mm -hmm. the different pockets of variable compensation usage and make sure we get that uh, documented. So even as we get into implementation and we're implementing the core team, we're contemplating the other plans and other potential users so the, you know, so the customer is aware of, of them and that being something that can be brought on. And then that's squarely in 
the future op potential for for our customer AE to potentially tackle. So that's a new process we added um, to ensure that uh, we start to capture that potential upside. In the past, it's been like, you know, close the seat, you can close and move on. So um, that's been a move that I think is going to start to help us get better in really meeting the needs of our customer. And then, of course, growing our revenue profile within each customer that way. Um, so yeah, I think the important thing that you talked about was the uh, the customer journey. And I think, you know, yeah. a couple things. One, you know, I would, depending upon the motion and the deal size, like probably introducing the the, the CS folks prior to post-sale, right? And so bringing them in. But I think it's just really important to take a step back and really just lay out that customer journey. And for every part of that customer journey, identify the friction points, identify the transaction, uh, the transition points, then you can build the measurements for those. And then based on those measurements, you can start to build out the incentive programs. And also being very clear and transparent what that looks like externally for the customer, right? Because I think sometimes the customers can be confused. Wait a minute, I thought you were my rep. Who's this person doing the onboarding? Now I got somebody else I'm talking to. So really defining that customer journey clearly from an internal perspective and then representing it in a way that's easy to understand and makes sense for the, the customers as well. And so I think you can build some of the incentives uh, the incentives around that. It's a great point. You, you don't need to make the complexities of implementing your product the customer's problem, ultimately, right? You have to be real clear with them where they live inside it and minimize the touch points to make their experience the best while you're implementing, you know, a solution. So I think it's a great call out. Yep. Um, exactly. I, Do we have any, uh, any questions from the audience on this point or before we go to the next? I, I had one I want to double click on, which yeah. is streamline, streamline communication while we wait on that Q and A. Just in addition to, for anyone moving into the enterprise, I would even argue that right now, enterprise purchasing, the, the scrutiny is even higher. So. There's, I mentioned switching verticals, but just in general, there are added steps. Velocity in enterprise is down. There was a recent sales assembly assembly study that there's, you know, it, it's adding as much as 30 days to the, the velocity period, uh, lower even for lower ACVs. So all I throw out to our frontline sales leaders there is extra scrutiny and uh, to some extent, you know, true management of the entire buying process late has become so important. And unfortunately for me, Clary didn't tell me I was going to have the slips I was going to have because uh, I'm just, I'm joking, Kevin. It was because the, the industry has shifted yeah. and this extra time. So it was telling me one thing, but you know, you have two or three of these that slip out a little bit. There's added scrutiny around security. I'm seeing more people trying to ask for their paper. There's just a lot around how these larger businesses are doing business that's slowing down late. And uh, so it, it takes extra detail in the yep. execution of those late deals. So I'll call that streamlined communication, but just an important thing for all sales leaders to understand is really going on out there right now. Matt, I'll, I'll double click on that. You know, in this environment where every dollar is scrutinized, you know, would, it typically means you're gonna now bring a CFO into, or someone in finance into a buying, into the buying process. And I think we did that really, really well at Clary. We saw a new persona emerge last quarter in making decisions. And that was CEO and board. Um, and, you know, typically following our process, we get a CRO on board, we get a CFO on board, and maybe someone from the, the operations team, we're golden, right? We're, we're moving. But when you have in this environment, uh, um, you know, the board and the CEO evaluating every spend, they, they want to have their part of the process. And so we amended our sales process to now bring them into the fold earlier. And the reframe that I gave my team is you actually want them in because now they're going to be a stakeholder in using Clary. So let's bring them in. Let's bring them in early. And now you're going to have a better chance of the, the, the value our solution is going to provide because we've now gotten to the CEO. Now, I, I realize everybody on this call is selling at different places within an organization, different hierarchies, but I'd almost embrace in your sales process, you have an opportunity to get in front of more people. It's going to make you more valuable and sticky down the road. Yeah. The, the only last point I would add to that, I know we're probably tight on time, is not to do it sequ sequentially, right? I think there's right. an opportunity to be concurrent, right? You know, there's too many times you say, hey, we got to get through the, the champion, then we got to move to legal, then we got to move security. No, you need to get legal and security moving concurrently so you don't get to the point at the end where 
hey, we're ready to go. Ah, we got to do red lines. Oh, we have to do a security questionnaire because that's paying for the business. That's paying for the business champion. So being able to identify what that buying process is, you know, understand what the multi-threads are and then manage those concurrently can also help you decrease the time. I know there was a question that there about some of the some of the urgency. So yeah, I know running them in parallel is vital. I, I couldn't agree more. And Kevin, I agree with you. Our, our increase in CFO involvement has led to actually some product enhancements, which has been great. And that's the more strategic side of commissions, the true cost versus expected cost. So the point is, as they're dipping into the deals and our interactions, we're gaining more insights into how we can take care of those more strategic uh, personas. So uh, cool. Let me transition to the next. Matt, uh, sorry to interrupt here, but we had a question uh, specifically for you from our uh, guest, Harnu. He said, Matt, we're finding this in moving up market. How are you preparing your reps for shifts that you're seeing in the market going up market? Yeah, I, well, I, I'm going to speak to some of this later, but I think when you make them just one man's opinion, right? When you make that mid market, you know, large mid market to up market move. Um, one of the first things you have to understand is that, uh, at least for us anyway, our competitors were already there, right? Like I'm not in a new industry. It's been around for 30 years. They're already there. So you can't just have a cool new technology. You have to show a, a, an upmarket buyer is more concerned with risk. They're more concerned with risk of failure, your experiential risk. Can you really handle someone of my size? So what we've done is really driven a different experience. You know, we've differentiated our sales process based on size of customer. We've added layers of what we call expert services, which is kind of, these are, you know, ninjas in the commission space who go deeper on the types of plans they're going to see. They go deeper on the types of data that might be impacting those plans, call it our expert services group. And that is in one part for us to better understand and prepare ourselves for that Im implementation, but also as a differentiator. So I think you know, the way I'd look at it is you need to contemplate that bigger ACV we're all going after. You're going to want to invest more on the front end and you have to show the customer, the prospect, the market that you're ready and that your risk is low relative to what they might perceive given your, your history in the past. And that comes through process, but also just coaching at the AE level and ensuring you've got those right steps to uh, to do a holistic view an enterprise uh, you know, uh, evaluation of a solution like SPIF is deeper and broader naturally because we're going to solve different problems. You have to be prepared to research it that way and have your team guide the process through those incremental steps. That's what I guess I'd throw out. Yeah. The, the only thing I would add on that is you move upstream, you know, it becomes less of a product flavored sale and more of a value based sale. And right from the enterprise level upstream, they don't care as much about the features of the product. They want to know who else is using them and what is the value that it's creating. So I would just shift the enablement of the team from a product motion to the use cases and the value motion as well. Yeah, I agree. I think some products are, you, there are table stakes on the product side, though, sure. that you have to yep. have, but, but uh, very fair point. Cool. So let's uh, move right along then. Obviously, uh, I, I hopefully, yeah, you're seeing my slide. Good. Um, so we've, like, markets are shifting always. Uh, it's uh, are you making changes to how you incentivize your team to keep up? And, and what we're seeing as a trend in our space is flexibility and self-management being key to leveraging commission solutions. You know, if markets are shifting, we've seen it quarterly to some extent. You can't be, you know, married to the commission plan from the CRO before you that you didn't want to change because it would have been too much change management. We're all guilty of this. You just add a component or two. Well, now, you got someone else's plan. You got a revenue mix need that's completely different. So you really have to be, you know, focused on ensuring that you're you're making changes as well, uh, uh, you know, along the way. So one little known data point that I'll add to this, uh, co according to an Ernst and Young study from about four years ago, commissions represent nearly ten percent of most companies' annual spend. That's a top five item. Just imagine, you know, a CFO understanding the return I'm getting on that. And this is where commissions is becoming more strategic because what you incentivize around and what you do for those, that 10%, that's a significant amount of money. You know, you probably got HR, you know, your employee spend is the top one, but 10% uh, is nothing to shake a, a stick at. So you can see some data here from the Incentive Research Foundation as well. 90% of top performing companies utilize incentive programs. You can see the percent that believe that properly structured incentive programs can uh, increase performance, which of course, uh, you know, is near and dear to, to my heart. 
and then um, you know achievement goal achievement having a, a specific tie to incentive programs. So I'm going to show a visual here. You know, I, I used to say as I joined the commission space that the commissions for too long has been this pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And, you know, you you go through the process of distributing the plans. Everyone signs them, you know, pre SKO, post SKO. And then they oftentimes tuck them away. Maybe they'll make a little side uh, Excel spreadsheet so they can pot potentially track what's going on. But the truth of the matter is it's always it's tended to be. How much am I going to make on the deal I close? So what you're seeing here is the trend in commission around visibility and transparency early and often. So with a solution like SPIF, you can see your estimated commission at the time you build an opportunity in CRM. How much am I going to make on this based on its close date, based on where I'm at in my accelerators year to date? You can build it into where as you create a quote in CPQ, there's a specific payout that's clear there as well. You can do it as a collective. I want to see everything eval forward. How much money do I make then? And then you can, of course, make sure you've got, you know, very tight calculations, including tracing down to deals specifically as well. So I think this is a big trend from a transparency perspective, getting in the middle of more things or more of the steps and stages. And that's what drives behavior from my perspective, right? It's not just tell me at the end what I'm going to make, but make sure I understand how I'm going to make along the way. Remember, incentive compensation is meant to drive behavior, which is what we're really trying to get at. So uh, so aligning comp planning with execution, I, I can't tell you how often I say when I'm talking to, to buyers, I use this line. I'm like, this assumes, of course, that your commission plan aligns with your revenue plan. Because when we talk about driving incentives early and often, it only works if the commission plan has been adjusted to align with what that revenue uh, revenue need specifically is. So, you know, it's just so very often people kind of set it, forget it. And you're, you're losing, it may not be, you know, you're losing opportunity there by not aligning it better. So um, incentivize the right behaviors for the right outcome. Uh, quite obvious. Measurement is clear, you know, and try to make changes as a recommendation. You, you don't be afraid to make some adjustments, make some changes, add added incentives for new verticals that you're going after, you know, add an incentive around a certain competitor that's low pricing you that you're bringing up and see if that's something that can help you ensure you create a, a spotlight focus on uh, on them as well and continue to obviously adjust and, uh, and iterate over time. So um, so on the right hand side, you know, this is really what your comp manager, comp executive and your AEs are looking for as they think of, you know, commission management compensation. These are all core and germane to what SPIF brings to the market and just allows you to to have a far more visibly uh, are visible and, and scalable and open uh, open platform. So I have a, a, a bit of a rando question before I get into the next area, which is uh, for Kevin and, and Ryan. Let's jump jump to kind of like managerial VP level commission and compensation. How have you seen those plans evolve over the years? You know, uh, it, be it tied to quota retire or you know quota attainment on a periodic basis, tied directly to commission. And, uh, you know, what have you seen from a leadership commission perspective over your years? And, and maybe you have an idea of which types of plans you've really thought of uh, have hit the mark well to motivate the right way. And Kevin, we'll start with you. Yeah. Um, you know, they've definitely evolved in my time here. And look, we've all evolved our go to market year over year. There's been times where, you know, leaders own both new logo and customer and times where leaders just owned new cus new logo or just customer. And so. Both of those are, are different factors. When you bring customer in, you're thinking of things like uh, NRR, right? Net dollar retention. When you're just new logo, you're you know simply looking at, you know, am I going to hit my quota? And so that the customer journey brings complexities. And based on how you have your go-to-market set up that year, the plans change. Um, and, you know, we entered this year with some blended teams. And so our leaders had some new comp plans that quite honestly were new to them as we entered this year. And so you do really have to you know, think about how you design them because what you don't want is one thing to take focus over the other, right? You don't want new logo to trump their attention if they own you know, expansion and renewal. And so that, that design is super important because you know, anyone in a sales role is coin operated and they're gonna go to where they can most maximize their plan. And so th those were some things to think about. And there are honestly things worth thinking about as we finalize our FY25 plan is not just how we're going to incentivize rep behavior, 
customer success behavior, but leader behavior as well in service of hitting the growth targets, the retention targets, et cetera. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think some of the things, you know, obviously as you, you know, you know deal with more senior um, compensation plans, there's a lot of creativity around, you know, the equity packages, whether it's, you know, single triggers or exercise window or ability to sell in the secondary, there's all those levers. And then as Kevin mentioned on the behavior side, you know, you, you do have some, some, you know, ability to carve out some things that are maybe a little bit less tangible as well. Right. I've seen some where it's, you know, career development, uh, maybe more of the director level, but what are you doing to develop people's careers? What are you doing from a hiring perspective? Like, so, you know, maybe 10% of comp in some executives can be tied to some of those behavioral things. And then as Kevin mentioned, from a sales perspective, I think the, the, the line is also moving a little bit more towards metrics like NRR, where it's not just about getting uh, as much revenue in the door as possible. It's making sure you're getting the right revenue in as well. Yeah, it's a great point on MBOs. I think uh, oftentimes, you know, those get lost, but, uh, you know, I, I'm, it's important to keep a component in that may not just be tied to the dollar, right, to that point. Like, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm often preaching to my team as a frontline sales leader, you should be interviewing candidates every month. There's just, just no two ways about it. You must, or because when you need them, you want to have that network built. So it's a simple little MBO. Maybe there's some compensation tied to ensuring something like that happens, right? So I, I appreciate that call out. Um, before I move to the next section, I, I failed to advance my slide. So this is kind of the concept here of, of commission throughout the different processes. I'm sorry. This is what happens, Megan, when you put me in charge of this stuff. Um, so uh, so let's move to the next section here, which is uh, short-term levers for improving win rates. And I guess I'd start by saying, I, you know, I don't know that there's an easy way. I don't know what short-term means, but, you know, flipping win rates overnight is, uh, is not an easy thing to do, certainly in a, in a meaningful way. And I would actually caution, I think in the, in the, in the world of, of data and, and lagging indicators, I'm starting to see some people measure win rates like on a weekly basis or a monthly basis. And I would just caution against how you know, much you, you know, micro measure. You gotta always keep an eye on things, but win rates are more of a trend. You need enough in the, in the end, you know, enough in the sample size to ensure you have uh, meaningful data. But that said, it is a this is a key driver. Obviously, there's only so many levers you can pull to drive uh, revenue growth. And if you can up that win rate from 25 to 50, uh, assuming you have the same amount coming in, that's doubling your business. That's a pretty good, pretty good sign. So um, so let's let's get into uh, one quick uh, data point here. Boston Consulting Group, who defines transformation as when your revenue mix or your business undergoes a significant change over a period of time. Um, and revenue levers can be a, a big contributor. You know, 95% of the transformations they studied in this one uh, in this one report had a revenue growth lever as something that uh, um, that that drove that outcome. And one lever is obviously uh, win rates. You know, it's it's a, it's a meaningful measure of efficiency. And and by the way, everyone seems to do win rates slightly differently. You can do them where you're taking uh, time into account. You know, but the simplest way to look at it, at least, you know, on a, on a call it a quarterly basis is a you know, total number of deals won over total number of deals, you know, dispositioned, as I call it, won or lost right over that period to understand what percentage of your inventory uh, you're winning and, and taking and taking in. So so some quick, effective ways to um, to boost win rates. One is, I think, to be clear what you're measuring. Right. Are you measuring win rate by industry segment sales team? What's the period? Let's be clear on what you think is meaningful from a measure perspective, measurement perspective, and then diagnosing the changes in win rate by stage, right? That's where you dip into, okay, where are we seeing fall off? So, um, you know, starting in 23, we saw an increase in discovery fall offs. And it was just, it was really, so I've seen a lot of losses in those early days, very much tied to people just pumping the brakes on anything at that given period and not necessarily going past the first call. So what we do, we double down on our discovery call process. We started to work with more upfront contract type conversations to make it a more meaningful process for the buyer. We got into more why spiff, why now questioning uh, to really make sure that this is something that they not only had some interest in, but potentially were willing to look at. And obviously started to dig into the business risk of doing nothing. We're still in many cases, probably 65% of the time 
70% of the time, first time uh, buyer scenario. So talking to AE engagement, uh, you know, of any time to need your top revenue producers, it's now as revenue is a little bit harder to come by, what are you doing to keep them engaged? So we did a lot of work on that front end to ensure we could help that conversion rate, um, for example. So um, business cases that resonate, and I think you know, Kevin mentioned earlier, the involvement of the CFO, that, that is in more purchases now than I've ever seen before. And a common drop in win rate year over year has come for a lot of us at pricing stage where you're sliding across the price and you know um, that potentially is not going to pass the CFO's uh, approach. And in many instances, you have buyers that you're working with who've never had to deal with a business case scenario before because this is a new thing in their organization. Um, so you got to ask yourself, do we have a sound business case? You know, is ROI necessary? Has the buyer ever prepared one of those before? And um, how do we make sure we put it in terms that the CFO will understand and that will resonate? And uh, and it can't be about you at all, right? It has to be about their specific, and it also can't be too generalized. So this is another area that we've started to dip more enablement time into is just ensuring that on their terms, we're helping our front end administrators who usually go get the budget for what we're doing, having the right type of case uh, for, uh, for making a purchase. And the last area here is just around uh, competitive clarity. I think it's important to track your win rate by competitor. You'll get emerging competitors popping up. You need to learn quickly how to overcome those and understand, you know, is it pricing or what is it in particular that they're doing? Um, and I would throw this out. This is pretty old school, but that direct call from the sales executive to that win or that loss to, to spend 30 minutes really understanding qualitatively. You can't do this with all the data, but with some, it still is gold in what it can share for you. So make sure that, uh, you know, you're understanding that. And we actually have incentives in place for a couple of our competitors. And those have changed over the course of the year as we've had different ones pop up. So it's another way to potentially, you know, leverage, uh, leverage incentive to drive competitive win rate increase. So, um, so now I have an open question and Ryan, I'll start with you. We talked about manager comp before, but maybe you could share some of the commission structures that you've put in place over the years, you know, what's worked for you and why, and, and also any that you reflected upon, maybe plan approaches you took that didn't work. Um, get some thoughts there. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot that didn't work, but I think the, um, I think in terms of some of the things that were maybe successful in, in driving some urgency, we did it. We did a, um, a commission plan once where, you know, we had these annual uh, contracts and it was always like the last two weeks of December were just a complete disaster because everybody. And so we added a incentive component to get deals in earlier. So for Q4, you got, I can't remember what it was. It was like two extra points of uh, commission to get it in. Um, you know, two months earlier, one extra point for a month earlier. So thinking about what's good for the business in terms of a reporting standpoint um, and aligning some incentives around that was uh, was fairly effective um, to get people more incentivized to, to do things earlier. Um, you know, I think the, the product, ba product based incentives are really effective working with a product team when you're launching a new product before you just bake it into a sales plan. Or a compensation plan, use a quarter, test it, right? And drive some incentives. Um, some of the things that didn't work, it came up in the first slide around the segmentation. I think it's really important to make sure that you're really clear on the segmentation from two things. One, you know, sort of the the the, the types of companies that you're going after, the ICP, like you don't always want to just cut books based on the size of the company. You know, sometimes it has to be based on the um, you know, the profile of the company. And two, cutting books on the maturity of the industry. Right. You know, I've managed international businesses before. You sort of take these US based plans, you say, all right, we're going to drop it in, you know, Germany or, you know, the Netherlands or whatnot. But we had to distill out the maturity from a design perspective for Envision to say, you know what, we should be using the plan from the US probably two to three years earlier. And so, whatever your segmentation is and how you're using that to feed into the compensation, you just got to make sure that it's nuanced to the right maturity of the industry and to the right, you know, metric that you're using to define those, those segments. Um, don't know if that makes sense, but yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. Kevin, you have thoughts? Yeah. You know, I've got a lot of thoughts here. So we did an acquisition about three months ago and because it was done later in the, the year, we didn't really want to disrupt current plans on, 
you know, th those existing and those were joining us from the acquired company called Groove. And so we led with spiffs in the short term to sort of boost behavior. Um, you know, looking back, that got a short term yield, but it really didn't it didn't get us great longer term because at the end of the day, folks were still working to maximize the comp plans they were on versus the short term. And, you know, as you start to think about it, when you do acquisitions, you actually create new paths to revenue, land motions, et cetera. And so as you think about a commission plan, you also you know, are thinking about your pricing and packaging and how that fits into maximizing the commission plan and, and vice versa. And so those are two things that, you know, we didn't have the time with the acquisition to Murian map, but we now do. Um, and so I think, you know, as anyone who's out there contemplating an acquisition, you know, really take a hard look at the routes to market, pricing and packaging as it relates to the comp plans that are in place at time of acquisition and how you'll change that. And our goal was to, to you know, make the changes as we get into the new year. Awesome. Great. Thanks. Thanks both for the comments. Um, Ryan, I'm kicking it to you now, and I've I've over talked, so we have 15 minutes left. So I wanted typical, to do that. Typical, one. typical. And the last thing, just to over talk as well. There was a question in there relative to some some of the predictability. The one note I'll make on something that's worked in the past was with my you know directors. We would do a closest to the pin incentive using Clary, and we would basically um, at the beginning of every quarter, everybody had to call their number by the end of the quarter, and you know it was fun, whatever. But we had an incentive tied to it. We had a winner. We celebrated it. They got some spiff, some some bonus cash. Um, but that was really good to help people, you know, sort of pr provide some predictability to the business. Yeah, we all know predictability is key. So that's cool. Yeah. So so we'll look here quickly at you know how you can manipulate some of the some of the comp levers. Um, and if you're looking here, like these are some of the revenue drivers by stage, right? So you see the different stages here by ARR. And some of the priorities you should think about when building out your comp plan. So zero to one, you know, you're still sort of in the, the the product fit, product market fit finding stage. And so you want to have individual incentives and tied around things like just initial customer acquisition. You can look at things like just comping people based on the number of logos within your ICP, right? At this stage, it's as much about as getting the logo as it is the revenue. And so, um, you know, it's also you want those early customers to provide the feedback to the rest of the organization. And you can create some incentives around that. One to 10 is where you sort of nail product market fit, but it's early. You can start to blend the individual performance with some team-based incentives and start to introduce more post-sale metrics like, you know, customer activation um, during onboarding, usage, and, uh, and retention. 10 to 50, you know, this is, this is scale time. You, know, you can justify larger sales quotas, get more sophisticated on the types of metrics that you uh, you know will lead to healthy growth, like what we talked about with uh, with NRR. Um, and then, you know, with the 50 to 100, like things are real, right? And so at this point, you want to align the team with strategic company goals and metrics and really start to weaponize things like profit or equity uh, more to keep people incentivized and aligned long term. So... Creating commission plans by stage is really important to make sure you're aligned with company goals and also, you know, feeding into uh, feeding in the culture. And so this is when things really start to click, right? You're creating that path, tracking the right metrics, enabling with the right tools and making sure, you know, above everything with anything compensation related, keeping it simple. And just to add one more variable other than revenue size is sort of the, um, uh, you know, sort of the flavor of the revenue. And, you know, I have a lot of experience from Envision where he moved from a PLG and moved upstream to the enterprise, um, but thinking a little bit about some of the mechanics behind that, right? And so as you move from PLG to the enterprise, it brings a host of other questions and challenges. Your target persona or segment may change and you have to evolve your motion and, and then ultimately your compensation. Land and expand becomes another lever to incentivize the team. The complexity of the motion will change. You'll have to rethink the profile of your sales team and who you're hiring to manage this. Um, and it'll become increasingly complicated to keep all of the moving parts and customer touch points across sales, CS, and, uh, and product. So um, I do want to get into the question. So the, uh, the question for the group is, you know, what shifts have you found most critical in aligning sales, CS, and product to effectively cater to enterprise clients while maintaining the momentum of maybe a bottoms up growth motion. Kevin, I'll let you go first. 
Yeah, you know, we really started working on this again this year. A um, couple of things have happened. We've rolled out new capabilities that allow our customers to do more in service of the product. So self-service capability. So there's a, a point where you need to enable your install base um, and then to help them manage those solutions. So the role that the customer success folks change. And so that intersection of product customer success, account managers, as well as a partner community that we are now building, um, th that intersection becomes really un important. And a lot of it is you know, led by um, you know, releases that are happening from the product team. And so we had to rethink a bit sort of the, the, the AM customer success and now service partner engagement uh, on the post-sale side and rethink the customer journey and the handoffs to make sure that customers were still getting delighted the same they, they were before, but in a new way where they could do more themselves within the platform. And so it's a, it is a big journey, um, you know, one that we're in the middle of right now. And uh, we're getting great feedback, uh, you know, from our customers on their ability um, to do more and move quicker uh, across Clary. So I think it's it's an evolution of your SaaS process, your continuous customer journey. And if you leave a group out, you don't think about, we talked about this earlier, the right handoffs, um, you can break it pretty quickly. Yeah, no, it makes, uh, I can say as a, f f you know, firsthand customer, Mike, what I'm viewing in Clary now is is broader and deeper and easier to navigate for what it's worth. So something's working out there. Quick, quick plug. But I, I I can do more in there than I've been able to do in the past. I'm sure you increase my 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 cost at some point. I know, <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, but it's it's been a it, it's it's working for what it's worth. Yeah. So I to jump in on this question, I, I talked a little bit about moving up market because that question came earlier. So I think that's clear enough. It's just how you sell to these upmarket customers going deeper on the services side, showing expertise and to drive confidence uh, around this. I do think, you know, as you, as you contemplate an upmarket move, it's this whole, you know, you have to t still take care of the customer base, you know, dance with the, the date that brought you, so to speak. Um, but you have to add to, the roadmap uh, to ensure you're catering to these larger customers and the needs they have. And some of the simplest stuff that you don't think about is just the size of the teams you support in, in a product and creating, you know, the, the, the scalability in the platform that allows you to get, you know, down to team level, up to regional level, up to, and those are simple things, but also complex that have to be built into the product itself. So roadmap here, engagement with product in each of these sales cycles, um, engagement with uh, with the customers it pertains to any roadmap commitments made, measuring uh, you know the potential scale of that roadmap commitment too. So if I'm going to get in with a prospect who's in a specific industry, and you know they have a, a specific use case need or product need, if if we're going to potentially make that commitment, let's make sure we're measuring the the impact on our future ARR as well. So we're not just delaying one customer with that uh, functionality, but more broadly, you know, all, any customers in that area creates, you know, obviously a go-to-market opportunity for you as well. So, and one very simple thing that anyone who's de dealing with, you know, domestic mid-market is going to have to contemplate is, you know, the 24-7 expectation of the enterprise customer. They are operating worldwide every minute of every day. And if you're going to really be primetime enterprise ready, you're going to have to operate that way as well. Yeah. And the last thing I'll add on here is the PLG motion can be such a great data resource to help you build out, you know, some of the, uh, some of the incentives for the enterprise. An example would be using product level, uh, product led growth to understand specific features in the product or integrations that, you know, will our activities or behaviors that, you know, will lead to long time, uh, customer relationships. And so building those into the incentive program for like a customer success organization at the enterprise to get people to, if they do this activity, they integrate with these three tools, we know we have them. So I know we're getting a little tight on time, but we've talked about the nuances of the different company stages. Um, now we can talk a little bit more about the implications on scaling teams. And I'll go through this quickly, but you know, some of the strategies that we've discussed, you know, you can get more complex with tiered commission plans. Um, introduce some level of team-based incentives to complement some of the individual ones. Um, 
you know, there's an opportunity from a peer recognition. Like I'm a big, big believer in some incentives around, you know, creating a culture of feedback, you know, whether it's awards or, you know, different sort of, you know, behavioral recognitions that you can put some incentives behind. Um, and, you know, making sure you're revisiting these and working in collaboration. You know, one of the worst things about a commission plan is when they feel like they're being dropped out of the clouds on the team, right? And so make people feel like they were part of the process or at least they understand what went into the process. What were the priorities? What were the trade-offs? Who was involved? What did that look like? And really sort of double down on, on, on kind of the why. Which brings up, I think, as our last question, what are the key challenges you've encountered while scaling your sales team and how have you addressed them? I'll, I'll jump in first on this one. I, I, I've been doing this a while and I remember um, early days, publicly traded scenario, my CEO came to me and is like, we got to hire a bunch of people because I have to tell the street we're hiring a bunch of people because that means we're growing at a crazy pace. So it's just it's just amazing to me. OK, that's 18 plus 15 years ago. But at one point it was just butts and seats. And the world has changed for all of us at this point. The challenges with just doing that or any, you know, any anyway, now you've got sales magic number. You've got efficient growth focus. Um, you've got, you know, focus on how many what percentage of your team is over you know, 70%, over 70%. There's all these different measures of, you know, revenue growth uh, efficiency. So the the big three for me for challenges that I that I called some attention to, one is onboarding and realistic ramp and enablement. You know, ramp, when you build a ramp plan, think of the revenue phases we looked at. The, the ramp plan from one to 10 is not the same, you know, zero to one and one to 10. So you have to be very smart in how you're ensuring you've got the right type of onboarding and enablement program to help your people be successful. Second is pipeline coverage. I did the double the team, double the quota without the pipeline coverage. It's it's a disaster. So you have to, you if you want to be twice the size revenue wise, you're going to back into the, the demand gen side and the pipeline gen side of things three to six months ahead of time, as Kevin alluded to earlier, or else you're going to have a whole bunch of unproductive AEs out there, which isn't good for anyone. So, um, and I just think the other thing that I've seen done too fast when you scale too quickly is you water down the experience, the culture, the process, you overstress the machine. You have so many new people. There's not enough, you know, people to guide them in place. You have to ensure you've got that culture and depth uh, of, you know, who you are as a business and how you do things and then scale incrementally around it. Um, you know, cause that is part of why, you know, why you're as successful as you are. Yeah. I'll, I'll add a couple of things to, to Matt's here. And, you know, as I think about Ryan, the slide you presented a little earlier, it sort of had four stages of growth on it. Um, you know, I think, you know, on the Clary side, you know, having been with the company so long, there's probably two more stages that, that, you know, I've gone through now. And one of the things I think those of you will find that stay with your, your companies long enough is the way you sell will evolve. Right. In the early days, you're thinking about, you know, you've gone from product market fit to go to market fit. And you're probably trying to hire more missionary type sellers who are good at prospecting or get good in getting in front of people that can build and do all the hard work um, without all the infrastructure behind them. And then, you know, as you grow, you've, you've got to start to build the scale behind that of enablement and infrastructure. And eventually you get to a place where we are now where it's about platform. Um, they're selling to multiple different uh, buyers and business units and things get more complex. And so you have to help evolve your organization. And, you know, the, the challenge here is enablement becomes even more important. And you 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 don't just do this overnight. Right. It's a, it's an evolution. And so, you know, in, in my world, we're in this evolution now from solution to platform. And of all the stages it's probably the hardest um because there's so much more infrastructure involved in in being a platform we chatted about enterprise just a couple slides ago you know in you know you're not just doing a platform play you're you're really maturing an enterprise sales motion too and you want to bring those great sellers along that you hired that were super missionary and you know if you've been somewhere long enough a lot of your leaders were ICs at one point in time or another so um the journey continues it never just you don't just set it once and it ends, I guess would be my, my final point. Great point. Very well, true. 
All right, let's. I think we have time for one quick question. Just a reminder: we will get booted on the dot, unfortunately. And to all of you, we'll uh, follow up directly. But let's see. What well, question from Max? We want to commission MBO component around Salesforce hygiene. Have you done this before? And if yes, how did you measure it? This is kind of like a game. You have thirty seconds, Matt. <laughs> yeah, we have in the early days uh, of at least one organization, and um, yeah, I, I can't give the answer justice. But essentially, you have to tie building their territory and their database out to certain things. I think with the, you know, with the addition of SDRs, a lot of that gets put on them sometimes, but I do remember back in the day having some of this. So at a small scale, it can work for sure. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Thank everyone. you. Thank you.